Amen? They seem to go so fast. I wake up on uh, Sunday morning and it's already Friday evening. The time just seems to rush by. And uh, now that Mary and I are also helping out in Kaiko and Fidanaki, uh, the kilometers on the car uh, seem to be clocking up like nobody's business. But it's all good. It's all good. Just uh, last uh, Wednesday morning, I was out visiting with the elders. And uh, he said, this particular lady that we're going to visit now is uh, actually from the Mormon faith. I went, okay, all right. So we went in there and introduced ourselves. And uh, she welcomed, welcomed us in. And as I walk in, I was then in, in a bit of a confused uh, mode because I see all our children's books lined up against the wall. And then as I look at the table, there's all these testimonies from Sister Wife. And I'm going, what's going on here? So we um, opened up with a prayer and had a lovely fellowship with this lady. She's accepted the Seventh-day Adventist uh, message, praise the Lord, and she's just slowly um, working and praying for her family. So at the end of our particular conversation, I said, you know, I said, wouldn't it be great if we could have a prayer session in your home? She said, praise the Lord, Pastor. She says, that's exactly what I've dedicated this house to. So um, prayer is powerful. Only just yesterday, I got off my mower because they told us it was going to rain, right? And uh, I'm running around like uh, nobody's business to get everything done and tidy. And uh, as I finish for the day, waiting for this big downpour of rain, my phone uh, beeps. And as, as I read it, there's a text from a person who I don't know. It says, Pastor, could you come and have Bible studies with me? And I went, praise the Lord. Um, did I say yes or no? I said definitely yes. So we arranged a time for next week, and he said, praise the Lord, I'm looking forward to it. So God is good, and he is answering our prayers, and the Spirit of God is moving upon Whangarei, but also Kaikaui, and throughout our churches in the north. So keep praying, saints. Um, we want to see Jesus come soon, eh? And he is going to come soon. I'd like just to um, start my sermon off, just to give us a bit of background this morning. And um, before we do that, I'd just like you to uh, bow pr uh, again in prayer. Dearest Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful that we can be in your house, in your sanctuary this morning, Lord, to, um, to share your word, Lord, to study your word. And we thank you for the wonderful uh, study that we have in the Sabbath school, talking about your sanctuary. So, Lord, just may your spirit anoint, anoint us as we come before you this morning, in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus has just been to, well, basically started his ministry. He's just been to the wedding in Canaan, and uh, the disciples and everyone gathered there saw him perform a wonderful miracle whereby he turned water into wine. And as I was thinking and just reading about that, did they become his followers because they now had a fresh supply for ample amounts of wine? Well, grape juice, as we understand it to be? No, I don't think so. They saw something about Jesus that was different, and they wanted to, to follow him. So he makes his way down to Capernaum, and as he's walking down to Capernaum with his family, with his mother and his brothers, he's mingling with the group there, and uh, as he's talking and, and conversing with them, he noticed that everyone is kind of excited. They're excited but not too sure so as he listens to their conversation, he hears them talking about um, the preaching of John the Baptist, how he was preparing a people for the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Messiah, that first advent of our Savior. And as he's listening to them, he kind of corrects them in some areas. But of course, they didn't think that that particular Messiah that they were awaiting was actually walking with them um, as they went from then Capernaum up to Jerusalem. So he's also expounding scripture to them and explaining it to them, but still they didn't know that this humble man of Nazareth, of Galilee, was the Messiah. So as they then arrive um, in Jerusalem, uh, Jesus, as soon as he arrives there, he makes his way to the temple area. And as we know that that temple that was built was uh, the most beautiful architectural design in Jerusalem at, at that particular time because we saw also the discourse that he had with the dis disciples in Matthew 24 where they said, look, Lord, on the temple, isn't it beautiful? 
And he says to them, not one of these stones will be left upon, each other, uh, upon one another. But it's amazing how everyone celebrated the fact that this temple was in a beautiful architectural design made by King Solomon. But as he arrives at the temple, he's standing on the steps, looking down onto the temple. He views the activity that is going on in and around the temple. Christ takes in the scene before him, and he stands upon the steps, just taking it all in. Can you now visualize what's happening here? Here we have the very Messiah, the very one who gave the instructions for the temple, and he's looking at what's unfolding before his eyes. Now remember, it's the Passover, the Jewish Passover, which has been celebrated since the Jews came out of Egypt. Okay, so we're nearly, how long? Nearly 2,000 years away from that particular event. And they're still celebrating the Jewish Passover. So not only were, it, were the Jews of Jerusalem assembled at that particular Passover feast, because it wasn't just for one Sabbath, was it? It went for the whole week. And of course, um, there was Jews from all parts of Philistine and all around the neighboring countries. Other countries, they were there filling the temple courts, and it was required of everyone, every one of them, to bring an animal sacrifice. An animal sacrifice. So I don't know the numbers of the particular people there, but as I contemplated this scene, the closest I could imagine what was taking place was as if all of us and uh, went to camp, for an example, in, uh, in Rotorua. And you know the, the amount of people we've had at camps in the past, especially in Ardmore. There was a lot of us uh, Adventists gathered there. But could you just imagine if every one of us had to bring an animal to camp for sacrifice, what a commotion there would be in the camp. And it's kind of hard to visualize, isn't it? And what a, um, what a strain it would be on an animal if you had to bring it all the way from Tikal to Rotorua or from Wellington to Rotorua. It wouldn't be very fair on that particular animal. But this is what some of the people did. They brought their animals with them for, for sacrifice. And of course it wasn't practical because a lot of these people had come from, from all parts of Philistine and as I said in other countries and many of them didn't have the modern mode of transport that we have today. They, most of them would have been walking. Some of them would have had their donkeys to carry their possessions with them or elderly family members. So, again, quite impractical for them to bring an animal all the way to Jerusalem. However, provision was made in Jerusalem for the worships, worshippers to actually purchase um, stock to offer. So you imagine you've got sheep, you've got cattle and all other forms of offering available uh, to the worshippers who came to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover feast. However, the sellers were demanding such high prices, knowing that the worshippers would purchase an animal anyway in order that they'd receive a blessing um, for their offering as they came to Jerusalem. So what did they do? These sellers had inflated the prices of the animals and uh, there was a lot of haggling and bickering going on in the temple courts. They didn't want to leave without a blessing upon themselves or their families or their lands. And because of the enormous amount of offerings at the Passover, I suppose you could compare the commotion of animals bleating, the haggling of auctioneers or sellers and the, or the bartering of that flight of our, of our local carry sale yards on a very busy day um, and it is, it's quite a, a noisy place to be but not only was the, the animals there to be offered in regards to the sacrifice all pointing towards Jesus as the Lamb of God but also they had uh, a, year, a responsibility in that they had to give uh, a yearly half shekel of money that was required to support the temple, the temple work but of course, this was also inflated. The money changes had increased the rate of exchange as no other country, uh, currency sorry, was valid in paying what we could call temple taxes. So again, as we reflect on this particular uh, scene that is taking place before Jesus, the noise of animal bartering, 
the animals themselves, the money changes, the clinking of the money, detracted from the purpose of this beautiful sacred temple. Built to the glory of God, but reduced to a den of thieves. The temple and the sole purpose was for worship, but because of the commotion surrounding the worshippers, one couldn't even hear the prayers of the priest. Isn't that sad? This holy temple dedicated to the glory of God, dedicated for the sole purpose of worship, had become like a marketplace, a den of thieves. And as Jesus stood silently on those steps, his thoughts were of the priest and the rulers who were called to be the representatives of God to the nation. They should have corrected the abuses of the temple court, but the priests themselves were involved in this abuse. The priests themselves were uh, involved in profiting the money that was made by the sellers and the, and the money exchanges. They should have given to the people an example of integrity and compassion. Instead of stealing or working for their own profit, they should have considered the situation and needs of the worshippers and should have been ready to assist those who were not able to buy the required sacrifices but they weren't looking at the people, they were looking again at themselves. They had forgotten the call of God as Levites to minister on behalf of these people in God's holy temple. The nation, again, was so proud of the temple and so careful in performing their uh, required ceremonies that they forgot the, the weight of what they were doing. But this they did not do greed had hardened their hearts their hearts were not softened to the work of God and of course when you think of all those people who came to this feast of the Passover they came to those who were suffering those who were in want and distressed the blind the lame the deaf were there some were bought, bought on beds of sickness. Many came who were to, too poor to even purchase the humblest offering for the Lord. Too poor even to buy food with which to satisfy their own hunger. These people, these worshippers, were greatly distressed by the statements of the priest. The priest boasted of their piety. They claimed to be the guardians of the people but they were without sympathy or compassion. Wouldn't that be sad if people came to worship with us and we just left them and uh, couldn't care of what their situation was in life and they'd come to us for help, to seek um, forgiveness of the Lord. The poor, the sick, the dying made their vain plea for favor. Their suffering caused no pity in the hearts of the priest priests who had been called by God, priests who had dedicated their lives in service of the temple. Sad situation, isn't it? And again, as Jesus looked upon the whole scene, he saw the unfair transactions. He saw the distress of the poor, who thought that without the shedding of blood, there would be no forgiveness for their sins. So could you just imagine arriving there at the Passover in Jerusalem, not being able to afford an animal? You've traveled a long way and you're seeking forgiveness for the Lord because it's required of you to place your hand upon that particular animal, cut its throat and offer it up for an offering for the sins that have taken place in your lives. Sometimes think we've been let off a bit lightly and that we can only come to Jesus without, um, without making this offer because he is the Passover lamb. Christ saw that something must be done. Numerous ceremonies were enjoyed upon the people without the proper instruction of the, their significance. So as the people went through the motion, it just became tradition. They didn't understand the meaning of what they were doing. The worshippers offered their sacrifices without understanding, and they were typical of the only perfect sacrifice whom 
unrecognized and unhonored stood the one symbolized by all their service. The true Lamb of God stood upon those steps. He had given directions in regarding to the offerings. He understood their symbolic value and he saw that they were now perverted and misunderstood. How Jesus' heart must have been torn as he viewed that scene. Spiritual worship was fast disappearing from the temple court. The priests and the rulers had destroyed the link to God. Christ's work was to establish an altogether different worship. The gospel must be preached to the poor, Jesus thought. The whole sanctuary temple service exemplified the love of God in that everything pointed to that very sacrifice of love, of God's love, his only begotten son. But by their greed, the priests and the rulers were not only robbing the worshippers of their money, but also robbing them spiritually from the love and mercy of God's grace and goodness. By not upholding the true ministry of the temple of God. The temple of God exemplified the love of the Father. Again, Jesus standing there on the steps makes himself slowly a whip of rope. A whip of ropes he plaits slowly as he contemplates the scene. Then all of a sudden the people notice him standing on the steps. Slowly, silent fills the temple courts. And Jesus standing there in his humble garb displays an authority that the people have never experienced or seen before they stand in awe of him as his holiness pervades his being can you visualize the scene this humble carpenter from nazareth is standing in judgment of them all you could have heard a shekel drop on that marble floor in the temple then all of a sudden jesus speaks boom his voice that gave the instructions of Mount Sinai how to build the sanctuary as they took it through the desert, as he gave them instructions, and the very voice that passed down the Ten Commandments from Sinai suddenly rings with audible clarity throughout the temple. We can pick up the story in the book of John, chapter 2, verse 16, and in verse 16 it says here, Jesus says unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. Again, take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. As Jesus then descends the steps with his whip in hand like the sword of truth, he slowly bids them to depart and overturns their tables of exchange and merchandise. Amazingly, though, no one even considers to stop him or questions his authority. The temple is slowly emptied of all the presence of evil and filled again for its original purpose with holiness of the one who is present, our Lord and Saviour. Just as Jesus had announced to Moses to take off his shoes because the ground that he then stood on was now holy, so now again was the temple. And there, wherever Jesus is present, in the church, in prayer, in Bible studies, his holiness surrounds us. Looking at verse 17. As his disciples, now you could just imagine how they stood there with their mouth open when they saw what Jesus did. As they saw this scene, the disciples remembered in the psalm, um, I'm not too sure where where I found that now, it said, the seal of thine house hath eaten me up. Jesus' heart must have been really torn as he viewed that scene. Psalm 69, verse 9, that's the one. Yeah, thank you. From verse 18, then came some of the Jews back to him, and you kind of think, well, they even had the audacity to come back and, and to, to ask Jesus under what authority that he, that he was doing this. 
Jesus, an, Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And you could just imagine what the thoughts were going through their minds as they heard this. In three days he'll rebuild the temple. Because the old temple took how, many, how long? 46 years to build. And they think, how can he do this? Uh, verse 20, then said the Jews, 40 and 6 years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spoke of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. In the cleansing of the temple, Jesus was announcing his mission as the Messiah. And entering upon his work, that temple erected to, the, the, uh, to be the, uh, the, the, the house of the divine presence was to be designed as an object lesson for Israel and for the world. From eternal ages, it was God's purpose, God's purpose that every created being from the bright and holy angels of heaven to man should be a temple for the indwelling of the creator. But because of sin, because of sin that evaded the world, humanity ceased to be a temple of God. Darkened and defied by evil, the heart of man no longer revealed the glory of the divine one. But by the incarnation of the Son of God, the purpose of heaven is fulfilled. God now dwells in humanity because of the cross. And through saving grace, the heart of man becomes again his temple. God designed that the temple at Jerusalem should be a continual witness to the high goal open to every soul. Isn't that a powerful statement? The Jews had not understood the significance of the building. They regarded with so much pride that building, and yet they did, they did not yield themselves as holy temples by the divine spirit. The courts of the temple at Jerusalem, filled with tumult and unholy turmoil, represented all too truly the temple of their hearts, defiled by the presence of sensual passion and unholy thoughts. Isn't that sometimes the way our hearts are? In cleansing the temple from the world's buyers and sellers, Jesus announced his mission to cleanse the heart from the defilement of sin, from the earthly desires, the selfish lust and evil habits that corrupt the soul. Powerful, absolutely powerful. Jesus is there to cleanse our heart to make our temple uh, a place where the Holy Spirit can live and work in us. Know ye not that you are the temple of God? How many times have we read that and yet not really uh, reacted to what it's saying here? Know ye not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temples you are. And I just want us to think on that for, for a little while. How are we able to defile the temple of God? Is it simply defiled by what we put into it in, in the manner of uh, food and, and nourishing ourselves? Yes, it can be defiled that way too. But just think of the past week, how we could have possibly defiled our own temple and simply by what we've looked at this week. If we've viewed something through our eyes, through the portals of our temple, how have we defiled that particular temple? Something that we've listened to um, this week, has that also um, caused us to defile the temple that the Holy Spirit lives in? Our thoughts, have our thoughts been clean ones? Have our thoughts been thoughts to edify and glorify our God? Sometimes they aren't, are they? And this again is how we defile the temple of God. In what we wear, are we also giving glory to the temple of God? No man of himself can cast out the evil throng, throng that have taken possession of the heart. Alone we cannot do it. It is only by the saving grace of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Only Christ can cleanse the soul. 
We might look all pretty clean and sparkly this morning, sparkling this morning, but Jesus is the one who, who we need to allow full access to clean the temple. But the thing is, Jesus himself will not force an entrance. He comes not into the heart as to the temple of old, but he says, Behold, I stand at the door of the heart, and I knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him. What a wonderful verse, Revelation 3, verse 20. But the thing too, when Jesus comes, he doesn't come just for a day. He wants to remain there forever. Because as he comes in, he claims us to be his people. He will subdue our iniquities, and thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. That's a powerful statement, eh? Cast the depths, the, the sins of ours into the depths of the sea. His presence will cleanse and sanctify the soul. Becoming holy is what he wants us to be. That process of sanctification, as we mentioned in the Sabbath school. The Lord is holy. He wants us to be holy because we are his children. Amen? So that it may be a holy temple unto the glory of God our Father and through his Son, Jesus Christ, and habitation of God, the Holy Spirit. And why did the priest flee from the temple? Why did they not stand their ground? He who commanded them to go was a poor carpenter's son, a poor Galilean, without earthly rank or power, but yet they did not and they could not resist him. Why did they leave their gain? so ill acquired and fleed at the command of one whose outward appearance was so humble christ spoke with the authority of a king and in his appearance in the tones of his voice there was that which they had no power to resist you know i just can't wait to be in the presence of god of, of jesus my savior to see him uh, in, his, in his glory but to look upon his face and as he spoke those words to, to remove that merchandise out of the temple, even though he had authority, there was love and compassion in his voice for those sinners and for those who had caused the temple to become a place of thieves. At the word of command, they realized, as they had never realized before, their true position as hypocrites and robbers. When divinity surrounded the, that human form of Jesus, they just couldn't resist in uh, removing themselves from his presence. They felt as if before the throne of the eternal judge with their sentence passed on them for time and for eternity. For a time they were convinced that Christ was a prophet and m many believed him to be the Messiah. The Holy Spirit flashed into their minds the utterances of the prophets concerning Christ would they yield to his conviction or to this conviction? Repent, they would not. As they left the temple, they even told others who were coming to the temple, who were also priests, don't bother going there, just, just stay away. And of course, you know, these could have been people who were wanting to come into true worship, but they were blocked because of the selfishness of the priest. They knew that Christ's sympathy for the poor had now been aroused. They knew that they had been guilty uh, of extortion in their dealings with the people. Because Christ discerned their thoughts, they hated him. They wanted to get rid of Christ, and they made plans straight away to remove him. This public rebuke was humiliating to their pride, and they were jealous of his growing influence with the people. Isn't it amazing how Jesus loved the poor? And, uh, you know, that's exactly who we are. We are the ones who are poor in spirit. They determined to challenge him as to the power by which he had driven them forth and who gave him his power. Slowly and thoughtfully, but with hate in their hearts, they returned to the temple. But what a change had taken place in that short time of their absence. When they fled, the poor remained behind, and these were now looking to Jesus. The poor were looking to Jesus, whose countenance expressed his love and sympathy. With tears in his eyes, he said to the trembling ones around him, Fear not, 
Fear not, I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. For this cause I came into the world. Jesus, by cleansing that temple, had won a victory. And that the poor who stayed there saw, saw him for who he really uh, is. And when we think of just today, this morning, as we got up uh, out of bed and we think,